family pastor here at Christian Life Church, and it is good to see your beautiful faces this morning. Everybody get a smile on them? Can you smile? Are you awake yet? Are you, are you awake enough to smile this morning? I didn't see everybody smile. Everybody, y'all need some, see, some of you just need to crack a smile. Maybe that's just the, that, that moment where you just don't feel like smiling. You're just like, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and smile. And then maybe you just never know what happened. Maybe God just planned on a smile. So can I get a big smile from everybody this morning? All right, I see the teeth. That's good. That's good. <laughs> if you are a first time guest with us this morning, if you will look at one of the chairs in front of you, there is a I'm new card right there. If you'll take that card and fill it out and turn it in in the backpack there to April Jackson, she's right there. April Jackson, give us a big old wave. There's April Jackson. Y'all turn that card into her. We have a gift for you today. We want to give you a gift this morning. Thank you for being here today. And I just want to tell you, if you are a first time guest with us this morning, that uh, you aren't here by accident. God knew you were going to be here this morning. And he has something for you. And I pray today that all of us in this room, that, that we just open our hearts and just receive uh, whatever it is that God wants to pour into us this morning. Amen? Amen. I hope you guys come ready to, y'all come ready to worship. I look forward, I look forward to my Sundays and my Wednesdays because it is like, I tell people all the time, it's like a refilling station. It's, man, many of us that work jobs and are out in the work field, you're not around Christian people all the time. Can I get an Amen. Yeah, I understand all that. And so when you go to Walmart, you're not always around Christian people. But when you come into God's house, man, you are surrounded with people that have the same same goal. Man, we want to come in and worship. We want to come in and just touch heaven this morning. And so I, I believe today that God has a plan for you. And if you come in with an open heart ready to worship this morning, I know God can do amazing things. I want to read a scripture to you this morning before we pray. And uh, and. I was searching this morning. I knew normally when I come up, I, I come up to read the scripture and, and pray and, and welcome and all stuff. And I love doing all kinds of stuff. But this morning, I was really what I knew God was just kind of placing on my heart. I'm pretty excited about and excited about our church and what God is doing in our church. And so I want to share this scripture with you. Uh, it's in um, Isaiah 43, starting verse 15. No, 16, I'm sorry. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army, and reinforcements together. And they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. And this is the part I want to focus on. It says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. This morning I want... To tell you something no matter what it is that you are going through no matter what it is whatever battles you have been fighting no matter what god is on your side today and that if you begin to begin to not focus on the things that you've been through and begin to focus on where you're going that's why i tell people all the time that's why the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror because you're supposed to focus on what's ahead instead of so much what's behind you this morning when you come in and say god i know i've been through all this stuff today and I've been fighting these battles and fighting these battles, but God, what is it ahead that you have for me? Amen. And man, I believe that God is going to do great things. Amen? Amen. So let's pray this morning. Can I get you to maybe stand up with me? Come on up. I should have maybe got you to stand up with me to begin with. Oh, you're not Luke. <laughs> I knew Luke wasn't going to be here. Jared's all right. He's just a shorter version. <laughs> hey, Jared. <laughs> But let's pray this morning. You guys ready to worship today? Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do this morning. I believe for great things today. Lord, I believe for great things, God, in our nursery and God, in our kids' classes this morning. I know, God, that you're going to move in those, in those places, God. God, you don't just move in the main sanctuary, but God, you move in all the hearts, God. And I believe this morning, God, from the very youngest person we have in this church to the oldest today. God, the ones that are, God, maybe on the mountaintop this morning, God, the ones that are in the valley. Whoever it may be, Lord, I know, God, that you want to speak to our hearts this morning. And God, you want to do something great. So, God, open our hearts this morning to receive, God, from you, God. Make us sensitive, God, to the Spirit this morning. God, let your Holy Spirit reign in this place and move and move freely amongst us, God, and be, move freely in our lives. And, Lord, I thank you, God, that the things that are ahead are better than the things that are behind us. God, that we can forget the things in the past. 
And God, we can focus on what's ahead, Lord. And I believe for great things, Jesus. God, we love you so much. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. God is so good. You can remain standing. We, we have, God is doing some really good things here at CLC, and I'm excited about the future at CLC, and uh, I believe that, that God is, is orchestrating events, that God is making moves, that God is doing really good work here at the church, and, and uh, we, we've made some announcements, and I uh, wanted to take a minute this morning to... Uh, to make the announcement here in the sanctuary, we're making some transitions here on our staff, and um, and and Pastor Wesley Wednesday night announced to the students that um, that last Wednesday night was was his uh, last Wednesday night as the youth youth student pastor. And there, this Wednesday night, there's going to be a a big we love the speaks party, and uh, so that's going to be awesome. And um, and here's what I know. I know that nobody loves our students more than Pastor Wesley and Danielle. Amen. Nobody, nobody loves our students more than Pastor Wesley and Danielle. But they're, here's what's awesome, though. They're not going anywhere. They're not going anywhere. They are going to be, be focusing all of their ministry efforts on our kids and, and making CLC kids the best CLC kids can be, and I believe they're going to do a great job. They've been doing, they've been pulling double duty for a while with our students and with our kids, and uh, they're going to be transitioning now, and they're going to be focusing all of their ministry efforts on our kids, and they are going to kill it. Amen. 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 Now you may be asking, okay, so what's up with that? Where, what's what's happened to our students? Well. Part of the transition is that Jared and Juliana are going to be taking over as our student pastors, and they're going to be investing in the lives of our students, of our middle school and high school students, and they are going to do a fantastic job, and we are, we are looking forward to that. So much good happening. With, with, with that also, that means that, uh, that uh, uh, Michelle and, and Sean will be will be jumping in and, and leading our young adults full, uh, as their priority instead of as, as uh, partnering with Jared and Juliana. And uh, so we know that God, yeah, they're going to do a, a great job. And uh, a lot of stuff happens, of course. Ryan, if you saw Ryan in the cafe this morning, uh, Ryan is running the cafe. He is he is a happy yellow hammock employee. And so he's like, dude, I'm ready to jump back in there and, and work in the cafe. And so there's a lot of good stuff happening there. And, of course, that means that, that Chris and Cece are going to be able to uh, focus on first impressions. And we got a lot of good stuff happening, happening there as well. So much good stuff is happening here at CLC. Here's what I want us to do, though, this morning. I want to ask Pastor Wesley and Danielle to just to step up here as part of this transition. I want to ask uh, Pastor Jared and Juliana to step up here as part of this, this transition. And, uh, and we just want to pray this morning. We want to pray over what God is doing in our, in our kids and in our students, and uh, I believe that this that, that that this transition is going to be going to be a, a powerful transition. And um, and I'm going to ask Michelle to step up here as well as part of this transition into leading our young adults. And um, with, with Sean and Sean, of course, is at work this morning as he as he is pretty much every Sunday morning, um, making sure that that people get their groceries at, at Publix. And, uh, but we want to pray over, over these areas of ministry this morning. And we believe that God, that, that each one of these folks are stepping into, into a, uh, a more devoted area of ministry. And, uh, and uh, we're excited about, about these areas and believe that God is going to do really good things here. Aren't you excited? <laughs> Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the work that you're doing here at CLC. We thank you, God, for, for the vision and the path that you are preparing and laying out. We ask, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would touch and that you would move and that you would equip. Lord God, we pray for our, our, our youngest, our kids. God, we ask that you would, that you would pour your spirit on these, on these boys and girls. We ask God that you would use uh, Pastor Wesley and, and Danielle in this area to, to, to continue to pour out on these boys and girls. Lord, that, 
they would be discipled, that they would be grown to, to know you and to serve you, that they would hear your heart for them, that you love them. And God, I just pray your anointing on Pastor Wesley and Danielle, that you would continue to order their steps, God. And for, for Jared and, and Juliana, God, I just pray, Lord, that you would use them, God, as they invest in our students that you would strengthen them and give them a, a heart and a vision, God, that our, our sons and daughters would be full of your spirit, God, that our sons and daughters would be full and empowered and equipped by your spirit and that Jesus, that you would be glorified and that, that, our, that our sons and daughters, our youth and our, our students and our children's ministry, God, would be a place where, where worshipers are developed, God, a place where, where disciples are formed and where training happens in the hearts and the minds of our young people, God, so that they may grow to know you, God, and, and into our young adults, God, with Sean and Michelle, God, I pray that, that, they would be, that they would be able to connect with the local body, God, with this local church, and be able to get plugged in locally, God, as they transition out of, out of kids and out of students into the, into the overall life of the church, God. I pray, Lord God, that you would speak and move and use each area of these ministries, God. Each phase in the growth of our sons and daughters in this church, God, will be for your glory. It will be for your kingdom. God, that's why they're up here this morning is because each one of these folks this morning represents a transition in the, in, in, in the lives of in the development of lives from young babies all the way up to adults. Each one of these up here represents the transition. And God, we ask that you would that you would use each one of us in the development of our sons and daughters into adults who know God and want and live to make him known. We give you glory and we give you honor. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for all that you're doing. And let's let these folks know how much we love and appreciate them as well. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, I pray right now, God. I pray right now that this time, that this, that the rest of our time together will be a time that you are glorified, that you are worshipped, that you are felt, that you are experienced in this room. I just want to tell you, church, I've been, I've been in prayer this morning. I've been in a prayer room this morning. I just sense that God has work to do today. I just believe that God has work to do today. And I believe it's a good work. And I believe we're here because God loves us. And God has purpose and plan for us. God, do your good work. Do your good work today. In Jesus' name, let's worship the Lord together.
Father, there is nothing more that we want to do this morning than worship you, exalt you, and magnify who you are. Come on. How many people can feel him in this room this morning? Come on. John chapter 6, verse 48 through 51 says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. This morning as we prepare our hearts, our minds, and our attitudes to be able to receive the elements of communion, I want you to know that spiritually this morning, one way or the other, we will continue after this life. Come on. Sometimes we think, you know, it's not that big a deal. If I don't live for God right now, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to make up for it later. I, I have a, a relative of mine that believes in his mind that he's going to die. But right before he dies, he's going to have time to ask Christ to forgive him of all of his sins. I don't want to live a gamble like that. Come on. Scripture tells us in this passage that when we receive the bread of life, which is Christ, that we will not die, but we will live with him. And that's something powerful to be able to think about today. We may have issues and we may have problems in our own personal life, maybe at work, in our family, whatever's going on. But we have the opportunity and the privilege today to be able to, to worship him and to join together in the receiving of the elements of communion. What is the communion that we receive today? The, the juice that we have represents the blood of Christ and the bread that we have represents the 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 bread of, of life. So this morning, I want us to ask ourselves as we prepare our hearts to be able to receive communion. Some of us this morning, when you when you come to the front, or we have four different stations. We have two in the front and two in the back. And as you prepare yourself to be able to receive the elements today and you go to the different locations, you can come to the front this morning and be in prayer about anything. That's one of the things that our church is very, very adamant about, and I, I love that. If you need prayer, we're here to pray with you. Come on. How many people know today that we can't make it without, without God? Come on. And some of us can't make it without the encouragement of other people. Come on. We can't keep running to non-Christians asking them Christian advice. That's like going to a lawyer asking him if you need brain surgery. Come on. So this morning as we open up our minds and say, you keep saying open up your minds. Yeah, open it up to get rid of everything else that would be weighing you down right now. Whether it's your power maybe being turned off this week. Maybe you don't know what you're going to eat when you get home today. Maybe you don't even know if you have enough gas to get home today. Let that go because as of right now, you're right here. So let God do something right here, right now. Come on. As we prepare to receive the elements today, I want you to ask yourself, God, what is separating me from you? What is separating me from you? Not just his presence, but the call that he has on your life. How many ministers do we have in here? Raise your hand. How many believers of Christ do we have in this room? Raise your hand. Now keep your hand up. How many ministers do we have in this room? 
All of us may not be called to a pulpit ministry, but every one of us are called into ministry. Father, this morning we worship you, we exalt you, Lord, and we pray that as we prepare our lives to receive the elements of communion today, Lord, that through this act, that we would be drawn closer to you. That through this act of worship, through this act of obedience, God, that our lives, our hearts will be cleansed and we will be set apart for you. Lord, we worship you, Jesus. At this time, you may come to receive the elements. Yes, as you come, if you desire prayer, as Ray said, if you desire prayer for any, any need this morning, I want you to know that you can stay. We're going to pray for you during this time. We believe that God is at work in this sacred moment.
So the sin in your life is not a reason not to worship. It's the reason to worship. It's these times that God takes the coal and cleanses our lips. It's these times that God begins to purify our thought process, purify our hearts. There's a reason that we worship and we praise before we go into the Word because it's preparing us for something. There's a reason that when, when the Israelites went into battle, God told them to put the musicians out front. Not saying that the worship is more important than the Word or the Word is more important than the worship. They are a duality. They work together. You can't hear from God unless you hear from God. You open yourself up to things. That's why we do this. That's why we worship. That's why it's so imperative that the Holy Spirit get to begin to move in this place. Because guess what? Everybody in the world can read the Bible. Everybody has, has you know, they have the ability to read the Bible. But the Spirit only speaks to people who allow the Spirit to speak through the Scripture. So we praise before our breakthrough. Our song becomes our triumph. Our song goes ahead of us and breaks down the walls of Jericho. The God, God has delivered the enemy into our hands. And we just sing. Even though we can't see it. Even though we can't see it. It's like a dawn right after the darkest night. And if you don't know what to say, just open your mouth. Begin to let the Holy Spirit just work in you.
schedule that, that I typed out this morning. But I'm going to tell you something. Whenever I type out a schedule, I always in my spirit know that that schedule is always welcome to be interrupted. So we're just going to jump into the word. I believe that the word, I believe God has the word for right now. We're going to continue in our, our look at Jonah this morning. In the first week, we talked about an unprecedented miracle. That an unprecedented miracle required a move that Jonah was not willing to make. Jonah, God was calling Jonah into something, but Jonah wasn't willing to make the move. God was calling Jonah to Nineveh to tell Nineveh about the salvation of the Lord, but Jonah was unwilling to move. But God was calling Jonah to move because unprecedented miracles require movement. Unprecedented miracles require movement. They require us to move. We're, we're too often unwilling to be moved. We're often too unwilling to be made uncomfortable. We're, we're often too unwilling to be uncomfortable in who we minister to or who we serve in or how we love the lost. Or We're too unwilling to be uncomfortable how we give financially or, or uncomfortable in our worship time or uncomfortable in our prayer life or uncomfortable. But listen, it's often in the unprecedented miracles only come in those times where we, where we are willing to be made uncomfortable. Jonah was not willing to go where God was calling Jonah to go. God was going to Nineveh. God was going to Nineveh with or without Jonah. God was just inviting Jonah along to see the miracle. Which led us to week two. Nineveh was known for its cruelty. Jonah did not want to go be a part of the miracle in, in, in Nineveh. Nineveh was known for its cruelty, for torturing its captors, for killing their children. But Jonah wasn't running from Nineveh because of cruelty. Jonah was running from Nineveh because Jonah was running from God's mercy. God had mercy for, for Nineveh. God had a plan for Nineveh. God had salvation for Nineveh. And Jonah, in his hatred of the Ninevites, did not want to be a part of God's mercy. But in verse 1, or verse 4 of Jonah chapter 1, it says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Listen, we talked the last week. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea that caused the storm to threaten the ship and the lives of those on board. The Lord did that. The church, I want you to know, if you're a child of God, but you are running from obedience to God, you are running headlong into a storm. We don't, we don't preach that often. I talked about it last week. If you're a child of God living in disobedience, you will be disciplined by God because God loves you and God wants to bring you back on track. Sometimes God lets the winds blow and the storms come because he loves us too much to let us walk away from his will and his goodness for our life in our own comfortable sin. Because God loves you. So because God loved Jonah, they picked Jonah up and hurled him into the sea, and the sea uh, ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Listen, church, it's time. It's time that we as a body, it's time that we as individuals surrender to being tossed overboard into the good hands of God. When we are in disobedience, obedience seems like the worst option. But when we finally surrender, we understand that the sea is powerless. When we finally surrender, we discover the goodness and the mercy of God. Stop running, surrender. Stop running, surrender. Stop running, surrender to the good hand of God this morning. I, 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 someone said, hey, don't throw a bottle this Sunday morning. I said, I can't make any guarantees. Which brings us to the day, Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready. Are you ready? Yes. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. And the Lord appointed. Everybody say appointed. appointed. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Three days, three nights. Does that sound familiar to anybody? We'll get there, we'll get there. But first, there's a word in the first sentence. We said it together, appointed. Appointed, the Lord appointed. That means the Lord made happen. That means the Lord put it there. That means the Lord ordered it. That means the Lord commanded it to happen. That means that the Lord scheduled the migration pattern of the great fish before the great fish got there. God was already orchestrating the movement of the fish to coincide with the tossing overboard of Jonah. God appointed a great fish to be there in that moment. The Lord appointed.
appointed a great fish. He ordained it, a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah has to be thinking in this moment, it's over. It's done. There is no hope. I am done. This is the end of the line for me. I, I was running from God. I was running from God's presence. I was being disobedient. I got thrown into the sea. If that wasn't enough, now I am being eaten by a fish. This is the end of it for me. Let's stop there for a minute. Some of you are Jonah. Some of you are Jonah. You've had a week where it feels like it's over. You've had a week where you feel like it's it. I'm done. I feel like I've been thrown in the sea. I'm hanging out with Jonah in the belly of this, of this fish. It feels like you and Jonah are just waiting for the end to happen. That there is no hope. There is no escape. There is no way out. All of your dreams, all of your plans, gone. Your marriage, gone. Your calling, gone. Your ministry, gone. You're finished. You're done. You're over. Your relationship's broken. Your walk with God lost. That's Jonah. That's you this morning sinking, drowning, swallowed whole. That is Jonah and that is you today. But I want you to understand something. This sea creature was not there for Jonah's destruction. This sea creature was there for Jonah's deliverance. And I'm going to preach today, and you can join me if you'd like. That thing you faced this week that you believe bit your defeat was appointed for your deliverance. It was appointed for your deliverance. That great fish was appointed. God is still appointing our rescue. Sometimes our rescue feels more like our captivity. Sometimes our rescue looks more like our dismantling. Sometimes our rescue feels more like our execution. But God is not working on our defeat or the breaking of his promises. God is working on our rescue today. God is scheduling a rescue. God knows what it takes to get our attention. God knows how to get us where we can be captured by him. He knows the ship we got to get on. He knows the storm he's got to send. And he knows the big fish he's got to come alongside to swallow you up just to get you where he needs you to be. It's not the end, church. It's not the end. It's the rescue. It's not the end. It's the rescue. It's not the end. It's the rescue. I'm reminded of the story of Joseph, sold into slavery by his brothers. He could have sought their destruction. He spent years in slavery. He spent years in jail for a crime he didn't commit. But God was working a better end than Joseph could have ever imagined. Joseph becomes the second in charge of Egypt. He is able to rescue his family from a famine. And when he sees his brothers, he says to them, listen, as for you... You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Listen, his brothers thought they were setting up his captivity, but God was setting up their freedom. The enemy thinks that he is setting up your captivity, your, your end, but God is setting up your freedom. God is setting up your freedom. Listen to Paul's words in Romans chapter 8. If you've got a Bible, and you do because you have a phone, and that's the age we live in. Everybody can have a Bible. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. Are you ready? No. I'll give you a second. Romans chapter 8. Are you ready? Yes. All right, here we go. Again, I might throw a bottle in a second. Romans chapter 8, <laughs> verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for what? Good. For those who are called according to his purpose. How many of you are called this morning? Amen. And guess what? If you're here, you've been called here. Amen. It was appointed for you to be here today. It's not by accident that you showed up at CLC today. It's not by accident that you are sitting in that chair today. God appointed you to be here because God is working your rescue. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Listen, for those whom he foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of.
of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. But listen, not only were you called, you were predestined. I know it's a word we don't like because we're not we're not Calvinists. We we scared of that word predestination, but it's a Bible word, and you were predestined. Amen. You were called, and you were predestined. Just embrace it. What does that mean? It means that God knew, and God called me, and God loves me, and it's not an accident that God has chosen myself for salvation. God sent His Son to die so that I could be saved. It wasn't an accident. It was on purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn of many, bro many brothers. Now listen. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Amen. So if, we, if, we're, if we're predestined and we're called and we're justified and we're glorified, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, what? Who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Some of you are going through a storm. You feel like you've been swallowed up by the well. Let me tell you this morning. What shall separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves you, and God is working your rescue today. God is working all things for good. Sometimes it takes a jail cell. Sometimes it takes the belly of a whale. Sometimes it takes sin being exposed. But God has not appointed you for destruction. God has appointed you, his justified, to be glorified and to be saved. God has done it. Sometimes, church, when we go through the belly of the well, we don't see what God is working good in our lives. All we see is Stuff decomposing. All we see is stuff dying. When we're in the midst of the well, it feels like everything we see is, is dying. Everything we see around us is decaying. It's decomposing. It's being eaten alive. When we're in the belly of the well, we don't see how life could possibly be coming. We don't see how in the world rescue could possibly be coming. It smells like death. It looks like death. Everything around us is dying, and we think it's our destruction. But listen, I'm here to tell you that God has appointed the steps of the righteous. God has appointed the steps of the righteous. And even though Jonah was running from God and was in disobedience from God, If Jonah wasn't going to take the right steps, God was going to get a whale to sit to get him to get him back where he needed to go. The storm was Jonah's doing. We know that, right? The storm was because of Jonah's disobedience. The storm was Jonah's doing, but the great fish was God's mercy. God's rescue, God's deliverance, God's salvation. So you thought it was the end. Jonah thought it was the end. But God is only writing a better ending. See, it's in this moment that Jonah has an epiphany that the Lord has rescued him. Verse 1 of chapter 2, it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. 
saying, I cry, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. He answered me out of the belly of Sheol, that's the grave, and I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and floods surrounded me, all your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. Anybody been there? The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the root of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed up forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. Amen. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. Amen. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. This morning, it is never too late to cry out. It is not too late to cry out. My prayer came to you. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This is what he did. In the midst of this death and dying, in the midst of this Storm in the midst of being swallowed up, he remembered the Lord. It took a great fish. It took a great fish, but God finally got his attention. And I don't know what it's going to take for you this morning. I don't know what it's going to take for you, but God is working to get your attention. Jonah says, when my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord. He begins to pray. He remembers his vow to God. He begins to worship. The Lord is his salvation. Listen, I don't know what it's going to take for you, but the Lord is working your rescue. What you thought was your death, God is working for your rescue. First chapter, verse 10 of chapter 2, when the Lord spoke to the fish. And it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. <laughs> Listen, church, I tell you, you would rather be vomited out by the fish than die inside of it. And so sometimes when, when the rescue comes, there's some stink that has to be washed off. There's some things you have to be cleansed of. You have to let the Lord wash you and cleanse you. And, and there's that process of cleansing. But I would much rather be vomited out and have to be washed and stay in and die. See, what could have been Jonah's demise was Jonah's deliverance. Do you see God at work this morning? The Lord appointed the great fish. What could have been Jonah's tomb became Jonah's vehicle of salvation. God also appointed another tomb, church, to be the means of our salvation. Jesus tells us in Matthew 12, 40, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Like Jonah was in the belly of the fish, Jesus was in the belly of the earth. What was the natural use of the fish was used for a supernatural resurrection, and what was the natural use of the, of the tomb was used for spiritual resurrection. Because the belly of the fish was only a temporary home for Jonah. The belly of the earth was only a temporary home for Jesus. And the grave church will only be a temporary home for our mortal bodies. And whatever it is you're going through right now, if you will let it, it will just be a temporary home that, that brings about a greater miracle than you ever believed possible. Listen, Jesus will return. 
Those of us who are in the earth will be resurrected, but we haven't just been promised a future resurrection. We have, we have already been raised to life, to new life with Christ Jesus. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The Bible says the old is gone and the new has come. If you have accepted Christ into your life, you are a new creation. You are no longer a slave to sin. And what you thought was your, and, and though you thought your demise was imminent, Jesus is working good for you. Jesus, church, is a better Jonah. Jesus conquered hell, death, and the grave, and Jesus defeated sin. Listen, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's Romans 5, 8. That means that, that it was appointed, that the time was appointed, that Christ would come. And it was appointed just like the fish was appointed to come. Jesus was appointed to come. And at the right time, he would die. Hebrews 5, 5 says, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Just like, just like God appointed a great fish to be Jonah's rescue, God has appointed Jesus to be your rescue today. What looked like the end for Jesus, what brought him pain, and suffering and mockery and ridicule and despair was for our salvation and his exaltation. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also uh, uh, what? let us also lay aside the weight and the sin and which clings to us so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who was the proof for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Listen, church. Right now, you may be going through the tomb. Right now, you may be going through the belly of the fish. But listen. For the joy that is set before you, God has sent this rescue. Though it may be painful in the moment, Though it may be hard in the moment, God is working your rescue. And for the joy that is set before you, endure. Don't give up. 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 Keep going. Keep walking. Keep being obedient. Come back to him. Continue walking with him. Repent to him. Cry out to him. Don't give up. Keep going. Because in the moment, it feels hard. But joy is coming in the morning. There is hope. There is peace. There is restoration. There is reconciliation. There is life. There is hope. There is salvation coming for you, church. Right now. Right now, what you thought was the means by which you would suffer is the means by which you shall be saved. I'll say that again. What you thought was the means by which you would suffer is the means by which you shall be saved. God in Christ Jesus is setting you right and is setting things right. is not 
not finished. God is just doing whatever it takes to get you saved. God is just doing whatever it takes to get you home. God is just doing whatever it takes to rescue you. So I don't like being rescued this way. Well, then you can drown. the way I want to be rescued. This rescue is, is too hard. This rescue is too difficult. This is the rescue it takes to rescue you. Don't you think if there was another way to get your attention, he would have done it? Don't you think if there was another way to rescue you, he would have rescued you that way? God knows what it takes to rescue his people because he loves his people. He has good for his people. And he is working about your great salvation. He is rescuing you. And he has brought you here now today as part of his great rescue.